Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Scoop on K-State, a show about the K-State journey to become a next-gen land-grant, featuring insights and stories from Wildcats leading the way. I'm your host, Adam Walker, president and CEO of the K-State Alumni Association. As an R1 research university, K-State is a major public research university with three physical campuses, one global or virtual campus, and a presence in all 105 Kansas counties. And perhaps most importantly, we are a land-grant university. In the fall of 23, we launched our new strategic plan. We are building on our strong foundation and taking action to become the next-gen land-grant. We have a rich history of impactful research activities at K-State, and David Rosowski is here, Vice President for Research, uh, with us today to explain the different facets of our complex research enterprise and how our research approach has evolved over time. David, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Adam. It's really good to be with you. Yep. So some people, when we talk about research, you know, I hate to say it, they, their eyes may glaze over, but you're going to bring the energy today. We're going to talk <laughs> about research. You're going to tell us how exciting it is. Yeah. But for those that are unfamiliar, talk, talk to everybody. What is your role at K-State? So first of all, research is the magic that happens at, at universities. The research is discovery, research is innovation, research is creativity, research is what brings students and faculty to get together in the, in the process of discovery and creativity and innovation. And in many cases, it's, it's how we connect with the outside world. It's how we connect with industry. It's how we connect with um, uh, state and local governments. And it's how we connect with the federal government. Um, and it's how we bring attention and reputation and, and resources to the university. So I think, I think research is actually the coolest part of the university. <laughs> um, and and uh, K-State, as you said, has a, a long, rich, and proud history of being a land-grant public research university. My role as vice president is uh, to ensure that our faculty and our researchers, whether they're students or, or postdocs or research scientists or our faculty themselves, have the resources they need to be um, not just successful, but to be wickedly successful and to, and to achieve at the highest level um, in, in their research and their scholarship and in their creative work. Yeah. So a lot of times you think about a university, obviously teaching, service, right. and then the third component, research. Right. You think about research, uh, you know, and you think 20 years, 50 years ago, you know, if I thought of research, it's test tubes, right? right. It's basic right. research. How is what did research look like 20, 50 years ago, and and what does it look like today? How's it changed? Well, it's, it's actually changed a lot. We do still use test tubes, <laughs> um, uh, but but in fact, research has moved in the last, really in the last fifteen to twenty years, most most rapidly in the last decade, from what we would call disciplinary research to transdisciplinary research. So research, you know, there was chemistry research, and those mm -hmm. would be the folks that used the test tubes and the Bunsen burners. There would be engineering research that would build things, test things, design things. There would be research in the College of Education on uh, pedagogical practices, on best practices for classroom and for instructors. There would be research in agriculture. Uh, you can go on down the line. Today, more often than not, particularly with the um, large research grants that universities are pursuing, it involves faculty and researchers from multiple departments and multiple colleges and multiple disciplines. So that means that not only are the grants larger, but it means that our faculty need to develop the capability of talking with one another and understanding mm -hmm. what they bring to the table and how they can leverage that to be really competitive at the really innovative research and discovery work that we're pursuing. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, before you became a college administrator, you were heavily focused as an engineer. I and, was. And structural engineer at that. As I was. Would, what would you say to your younger self? If you could go back and, and, and tell David, uh, yeah. Where you're so at. let me back up just a second to be clear. So I, I was I, I've been in, in higher ed as a faculty member for 34 years. So I, yes, all of my degrees are in engineering. My research was in engineering and civil structural engineering. Went through all my faculty rank promotions, and then there was just this situation that came up where I, I believe it was our graduate program coordinator was going on sabbatical, and so the department chair asked if I would fill in. And young Dave said, 
yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and that just began a journey. So I, I found that I really enjoyed, in that case, enabling graduate students to become part of the department and to have success in their in their academic programs. And then from there, I became a department head and a dean and then a provost and now a vice president for research. Um, so to my younger self, uh, I would say don't, um, don't ever uh, walk away from an opportunity. Don't ever say no. Um, don't ever say you don't have time. Um, make sure that if you're presented with an opportunity uh, that piques your curiosity or your interest in some way, know that you'll have time and know that it will be rewarding. Yeah, very interesting. So maybe without you filling in or saying yes, might be a different path. May not be sitting here today. Well, you just don't know. But I tell you what, it's kind of a curse too, Adam. So if you say yes to everything, <laughs> uh, you end up with a pretty full plate. And then people realize they can pretty much keep coming to you. And yeah. um, fortunately, uh, my energy hasn't waned in the last 34 years. And so I, I still say yes a lot. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned, uh, interdisciplinary research. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So our next gen plan emphasizes the need for integrated and interdisciplinary research. Right. Why is this so important? And more importantly, how are we gonna accomplish this? Okay, that's a great question. Yep. And let's start with the why. Um, there's two answers to that. And they, they both come come together to, to, to form our strategy. The first is a lot of the federal agencies who support academic university-based research are um, increasingly looking at transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research, as I mentioned earlier. The other reason is, is um, is simply that the, the topics that are most challenging today uh, are the most complicated, complex problems that we face as a people and a place and a planet. They're big, nutty problems, and they are mm-hmm. not um, for a single discipline to tackle with any, any um, success. Uh, they are not simple problems. They're not always tractable problems. They're problems that require um, expertise coming from many different domains of knowledge and also different vantage points, different experiences, um, different languages of, of discovery and innovation, um, and different approaches to problem solving. And if, if, if you can bring those different views together, and let's face it, we're better than at a university mm-hmm. than to have all these different views. If you can bring those different views together into this, this cauldron of discovery, and you can support and nurture and resource that effort, and, and allow them to take time to learn how to communicate, to learn how to work across disciplines, and, and not to be silo-focused in their own domain. If you can support all that, the magic starts to happen. Mm-hmm. And when you can build that kind of a culture, and that's at the end of the day what I'm working hard to do, when you can build that kind of a culture, you can go after these really large problems to address these grand challenges that we're facing today and that we'll continue to face in the future. And those problems need university researchers, but they need us working in teams Mm -hmm. differently than we worked 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. I mean, I think you mentioned it, you know, last month we were talking about it, different silos. So, yes. for instance, water, research yes. on water. Yes. Why don't you tell everybody how many people on campus are doing research on water that maybe were siloed? So I, that's a great topic because what topic can you think of that is more hyperdisciplinary than water, right? Think about the challenge we face in Kansas mm-hmm. with the Ogallala, right? Think say. about that challenge. Mm-hmm. Think about the challenge of how Kansas will adapt to its low water future. That is not just this sliver of science or this sliver of ag or this sliver of engineering. That literally touches every part and corner of the university. So when we did our first call to say, hey, we're going to try to coalesce all this talent to build this cauldron around water and specifically around helping the state of Kansas prepare for its mm-hmm. low water future, we had 75 faculty step forward and say, hey, I work in that space. <laughs> now, we could have guessed maybe two dozen, maybe three dozen, but we had 75 step up. And you ask what the number is, and I'm telling you that's not the number. Because as people start to understand what we mean by bringing talent to bear on the study of water as a resource that's diminishing in our state and that's critically important to our state, yeah. you're going to see more and more faculty step up and say, I can help be part of those solutions. I can help be part of the team that helps address that challenge for Kansas. So I think the number is going to be in the hundreds. Yeah, pretty impactful. You talk about water, and it's been hypothesized by several people. You know, one day water may be as valuable as oil, you know, in the future. Absolutely. Who knows how many years, yep. but it's going to be a resource that we can't do without. Absolutely. So it's very important. And think about how, how the state of Kansas functions economically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, how our communities are built 
and uh, how our, our, our workforce is developed, uh, where the jobs are, where the jobs are likely to be. Um, water plays a big role. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, we talked about the impact for Kansans. Um, you know, there's a plan in place that outlines K State research activities and the impact on Kansans. Uh, what should we expect to see as a result of our cutting edge research, maybe in the next 10 years? Well, a big part of my focus in, in, in um, leading the Office of Research is connecting research and discovery to impact in Kansas. Uh, so that means not only working on problems that are of concern uh, or of relevance to Kansans, to Kansas communities, Kansas families, and Kansas businesses, but also helping the state of Kansas to grow and become more economically successful, um, grow in economic prosperity, and lift people's quality of lives. Mm -hmm. That, to me, as somebody who's been in academia at, at Land Grants for a long, long time, um, is most important. Yeah. And as much as I care about the the the, uh, the topics of research and, and the, the federal funding that we s compete for successfully and the number of papers and PhDs we produce and the visibility and the rankings we hold in the various uh, d domains of our research, at the end of the day, um, I'll consider our research to have been um, uh, successful and important if it's impactful on Kansans and Kansas, mm -hmm. the state. And so we've made a, a, a strong connection between our research and discovery activity, um, whether it's in the classroom or in the laboratory, in the field station, or, or, or in a virtual environment, our research and economic prosperity. So we have, in addition to the Next Gen Land Grant, uh, Next Gen K-State plan, we have the underpinning research growth plan, which helps to grow our research toward the goals that are in the Next Gen plan. We also have the economic prosperity plan that the Board of Regents asked us to develop and drive over the last three years since I've been here, which specifically invests in, supports, and drives those areas of research that we're really good at at K-State, mm -hmm. you know, things in food and agriculture and water and animal health and biodefense and biosecurity and engineering, drive those areas to help the state of Kansas to become globally competitive for jobs, yeah. businesses and jobs. So our work in economic prosperity that flows from our research is successful if we bring new dollars into the state of Kansas and we create new jobs for our graduates and others who want to stay in Kansas. Yeah, very impactful. And we're doing these visits, you know, the 105 community yes. visits. And there's so many issues pressing these communities. You talk about housing, child care, economic development, agriculture, what it may be. Broadband, these are real roads, problems everything. that we can help solve. Absolutely. And the neat thing is if you solve them here in Kansas, you can solve them anywhere in the world. Absolutely. So it's not just just Kansans. It is. That's our focus, right, is land grant. But – the neat thing is anything we solve here, you can solve across it the world. It scales, right? and I think exactly. that's a really important role. I mean, we are the nation's first operational land-grant university, and I think it's, it's, um, I think it's very exciting that President Linton has set this course for us to define the next-generation land-grant being next generation K-State mm -hmm. as the exemplar, right? For all these other land-grant universities that are going to go through similar discussions on their campus, what does it mean? to be a land-grant university today in the 21st mm -hmm. century and in, in, the, in the decades ahead. What can we learn from the way we've um, served our states for the last 150 years, uh, and what can we adapt to ser better serve our communities and families and, and citizens today and, and into the future? And I think that's, that's a noble calling for, for a university like ours, and I think research will play a, an outsized role um, it, because of, of the need to drive economic prosperity and quality of life. Yeah. So what are you most excited about for the future, K-State research? What would you say? Well, I think if we, if we uh, not if, I think, Adam, when we are successful um, in transforming this culture into one that is um, uh, uniquely competitive for these large transdisciplinary grants, I think we are a comprehensive public research university, but as you know, we're a little bit smaller than our peer institutions, uh, the bigger land grants. And I view that size um, as a competitive advantage for us. I think at the end of the day, it will be easier for us to build teams. I think it will be easier for us to walk between colleges mm -hmm. and, and, and departments and even campuses. I think it will just be more of an academic or an intellectual neighborhood than some of these much larger universities are. And I think that will provide us an advantage in creating these teams and executing on these competitive uh, grant proposals. So I'd love to see us be uh, one of the go-to institutions for these uh, big 
competitive transdisciplinary grants. And I'd yeah. love universities to want to work with us. Yeah, and I don't know if you want to mention it, but GRIP's one of those that's new, innovative. Yes transdisciplinary right. working across colleges you know so I think we, that's that was one of the first things we went out with once we set this agenda uh, early in my tenure here to 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 begin transforming this culture and it's not that we had a bad culture we had a great culture mm -hmm. but we had the potential to do something at a much larger scale that would allow us to tap into a new way of securing funding that the agencies are really um, supportive of so grip was essentially to help build that culture it was to to solicit teams to come together and propose their own topic, mm -hmm. any big nutty problem that we could see a connection between research and the grand challenges and research and economic development or economic prosperity, they could propose. And Adam, we were hoping we'd get three, four, maybe five proposals. And we got, uh, oh geez, we got somewhere in the 30s wow. uh, for proposals. These teams self-organized, worked together. We ended up funding uh, three um, and then uh, at, at a million dollars each over three years. So these are big proposals. And then we ended up funding another seven. So 10 of the proposals we funded seven at a, at a sort of a seed grant level to keep that team together and keep them competitive and working such together. great ideas. Yeah. And then we, we, huh. we knew we wanted to do something last year in artificial intelligence. So we launched what was called the Grip X program in artificial intelligence and the discipline. Same thing. The campus... Um, Overperformed. We were hoping maybe to get eight to ten uh, really good proposals in this space, and we got over twenty in this space as well. So we think we've tapped into something. We'll continue to to support that. Uh, one of the programs I just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago is called TAP Grants, and these are grants again to help offset the cost of bringing teams together, right? Whether it's travel costs or whether it's buying out of some of your other obligations, mm -hmm. or whether it's hiring some staff to assist in grant grant development. Uh, we now have new funds available specifically for these large center grant teams to um, hold together, to work together, to write that proposal, and to be successful. That's great. That's that's really that's what's neat too. You talk about AI. We talked about housing, yep. child care, you know, agricultural chemistry. I mean, research really spans across the university, no matter what. Uh, I mean, we have grants and global food systems that we support. Yeah. And again, our work is not to uh, keep keep our faculty from going after the big grants outside. Our work is to enable them to be competitive for those grants. So a lot of our funding internally, whether it's in AI or whether it's in global food systems uh, or whether it's in uh, energy systems, uh, our, our funding is intended as seed grant funding. So it's intended to support what they need to go to the next level and to be competitive for federal funding. That's and great. our faculty are stepping up. There's some am amazingly talented researchers at this university. Always have been. Yep. And now we're, we're seeking to empower them in different ways. Mm -hmm. Shine that spotlight. That's great. Yeah. So the Scoop on K-State podcast would yeah. not be complete without Call Hall ice cream. And we both threaten each other. Hey, well, there if this it got is. boring, we were going to uh, dive there in. There it is. And I just said, you have to let me eat it before it becomes <laughs> soup. <laughs> it's, it's soft, but it's not it's soupy okay. yet. So tell everybody what's what's in our bowl. What are we sharing today? Well, we we believe that what we what we're going to enjoy today is um, we're going to have some debate over what to call it, but we believe it's chocolate ice cream with chocolate chips, but it's also mint. Yeah. So it's something on the order of a chocolate chocolate chip mint, or a chocolate mint chocolate chip, or a mint mint chocolate chocolate chip. Yeah. So not mint chocolate chip. No, I don't it's think a it's a chocolate, chocolate ice chip. cream. If you looked at it, yeah. but it's got mint chocolate chips. Yeah. How about that. I think it's regular chocolate chips, but you 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 do. You. <laughs> There's some mint in there, though. <laughs> There's some mint in the ice cream. Yeah. it's very good, whatever it is. And and the advantage of you making me wait until we're done with this is I didn't spill it on your set. Yeah. Which well, I, we can yeah. the bloopers for, be yeah, for that. That'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. So we appreciate you joining us. Hey, so. It's so much fun to talk with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This has been The Scoop on K-State with uh, David Rosowski. Our next episode will feature a closer look at the engagement efforts and economic impacts at K-State is driving. I'm Adam Walker, President and CEO of K-State Alumni Association, and thanks for listening to our show. Be sure to share this podcast with other K-Staters and select that follow button on your podcast app so you'll never miss another episode. As always, K-State Alumni Association is your connection to campus, and thanks for watching or listening, and of course, go Cats!